So Pete, I'm from the University of Michigan, and or at least was until recent years, and I've always thought it's wonderful that Sweats and Green get credit for developing signal detection theory there in 1966. But some people thought of the same idea before. Yes, well the, the theory itself was developed back during the war. And of course in those days, uh, this kind of technique was in classified papers, and so people couldn't easily reference uh -huh. those things. Gradually things have become declassified now, and we're able to see work by Mitchum and people that, that goes right back into the, the heart of the war when people were developing these radar systems. But Green and Sweat, 66, you're right, that's the classic text that people reference. And they have these lovely, fairly simple equations you can use to calculate what, how, how much signal do you need, how loud a signal do you need. Yes. And they talk also about, we, also, we all know about the signal-to-noise ratio in our stereos. What does that have to do with signal detection theory? Yeah, so uh, the key aspect is that you have a, a signal, for, for instance, whether it's an enemy plane or you know, whether you have a particular illness, there's, there's potentially a signal associated with that, but there's noise associated with the world. A lot of static in the background on an electrical line or something. Absolutely, or you could look at an x-ray and there might be a slight blurry shape on the x-ray and you think, well, is that something that needs operating or not? And it's, it might not be clear whether or not it's bad. Um, and so it's that, it's that noise that's messing up the signal that means that you can't always make the perfect decision. So there's a fancy number called D prime, which has something to do with how much information there is in the system. Is that the right way to think about it? Yeah, um, I'm happy to avoid the technical lingo, but yeah, ultimately it depends on how much these, these the signal from the dangerous case, the signal from the safe case, how much they're overlapping. If they overlap a lot, then you really don't know what the state of the world really there's is. There's no information. Right. There's, yeah, uh, in some situations, there's no information at all. So it seems to me, though, that natural selection should shape these detection and processing systems to increase what's called the area under the curve, or the amount of information, so you have a, a lower ratio of false alarms to true ones. Yes. Um, is that basically what happens with selection shaping these detection mechanisms? Well, yes, and we can see it. Um, if you just look at how someone's attention changes over time, uh, they might hear a noise, and that noise might be indicative of something bad having happened. They might hear a crash of glasses being dropped or something. And so they start with this vague picture of the world where they think, oh, perhaps something's bad has happened, and they, they then focus on it, and that is effectively narrowing those distributions. There's now very little overlap. When they've looked at it, they've discovered what the actual situation is wi without much ambiguity now. So I often think that I see many patients with snake phobias, some of whom have never, ever seen a snake in the wild. Right. And I actually wonder if that's why they have snake phobias. If, you, if you're in a place where there are lots of snakes and your mother taught you that one's dangerous, that one's not, that one's dangerous, that would give you a, more information about it. Just this abstract idea of snakes I think leaves many people with a generic, um, useless fear of all snakes. Does that make sense to you? It makes huge sense to me because uh, I've been fortunate enough to go to Florida a couple of times mm -hmm. where of course uh, you guys have got these fantastic alligators. Ah. And I was uh, a bit trepidatious at first, you know, you hear about these things as though they're these dangerous killers. And, and after a while, I found myself running after these things when I saw that one was about to swim away because I wanted to get closer. And, this doesn't and, sound and have a smart. This, sound, this sounds like someone who's not a native. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I'm, uh, that, that comes from being from Britain, I guess. Yeah, there are not uh, a lot of alligators in Britain that I know about, no. None. Not, no. E not even in the sewers, right? <laughs> <laughs> Only in the zoos, yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> and you can't get at those because they're behind glass. Right. So. <laughs>